What? Nick lost his drink. Yeah, what, whatever you like. You know? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but yeah, but what would be great is if someone over there wanted to hold the other end of it. But then it'll actually be like a washing line. Washing line. Okay. Hey, Alright, and this is John. Alright. <laughs> 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 supposedly Boris Johnson got the uh, hump with us because we had the audacity to raise with him the question of why he's criminalizing homeless people. Sack Boris! In six boroughs of London, it is now a criminal offence to commit rough sleeping. It's now a criminal offence. Now we all know the number of reasons for that. We were just here in front, but people can't afford to live in this city. People can't afford to pay the rent. There's a number, I mean I can look around here already and I can see a number of empty buildings where we could house people. But due to um, other laws that they are going to try to bring in through, they're going to criminalise that we are not allowed to occupy or live in empty premises that are there just for property. They're going to try and criminalise commercial squatting. Now, amongst the homeless community, we already know that the number of people have been served as well in Westminster, Lambeth, Camden, just for committing rough sleeping. Today in Brixton there's a police operation called Operation Swamp, where they're saying that uh, they're going to target on the trident uh, the black community for uh, their crimes of uh, being black. They're also going to criminalise rough sleepers today in Brixton and last night. I know of four people in Brixton last night who were moved on because they committed the offence of uh, going equipped get a sleeping bag in their bag and they were told to move on out of Brixton to get out of the borough or they would be arrested to face criminal offence. This evening at 6 o'clock we're going to go to Camden Town Hall where the Met Police are going to try and justify themselves. They're going to try and justify water cannons. They're going to try and justify recently where a number of squatters were arrested illegally in my opinion for occupying, and just occupying, not living in that premises, occupying a residential premises. The one message we will send to Boris now, I know everybody here will be involved, because I see quite a few people here who were here last week, I know a couple of people will be here later on. We're not going away. The homeless are revolting. Join them. Who's streets? Our streets! Who's streets? Our streets! Who's floor? Our floor! Who's chalk? Our floor! <laughs> Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you. Hi, yeah, I'm uh, Darren, one of the London Assembly members here, and we have got an absolute housing crisis in London. Uh, yet, what do we see as the Mayor of London's response to it? We see planning permission for yet more and more luxury development that are bought by very, very wealthy billionaire investors who then don't even want to live in them. They want to keep them empty so that they can then sell them at an even bigger profit some years down the line. It is absolutely, completely the wrong way about uh, how we should be dealing with housing in our city. So what we absolutely need is a focus not on more and more luxury blocks, of investor housing. We need social housing, we need more council housing, we need housing cooperatives, and we need them at rents that ordinary Londoners can afford to live in them. That's what we, that's what we need. So I'm very happy to come down and support this, uh, this demonstration today. One other key thing we absolutely need in London as well, and in the rest of the UK, is the reintroduction of rent control. Every Yay. single European country virtually has some form of protection from it for its tenants in the private rented sector to stop them being hit by massively unaffordable rent increases. We need that now. I know there's a lot of hysteria about those arguments that um, the housing market will collapse and landlords will not want to let and we won't have any houses for anyone anymore. Well, we heard these sort of hysterical arguments before the living wage was, uh, the, uh, the uh, minimum wage was introduced. Those arguments were nonsense then and these arguments about rent controls and nonsense as well. So we absolutely need rent controls. We absolutely need 
more social housing in this city, more genuinely affordable housing for Londoners, and we absolutely don't need yet more and more luxury apartment blocks that no one's going to live in. Thank you. Thank you very much, Darren. Um, I'd like to invite Tom to come up. My name's Tom. I'm from Charlotte, and I've rented privately in London for about no, sir. for about ten years. Um, now, I mean, the thing I wanted to talk about actually is, in some ways, I'm relatively privileged compared to most private renters. I've I've never had a rogue landlord. Um, <laughs> I only, for my partner and I, only spend about half of our income on rent. This is the most advantaged section of private rent in London. Um, um, and what does this mean? This means I spend half my income on rent. It means there's no way my partner and I could afford to have children and stay in London. Um, it means I was evicted from the place I was living, I'd lived in for five years, um, and couldn't afford to stay in my community. But my landlord was very nice about it but she still gave me two months notice to kick me out of my home. Um, and this is kind of what I want to talk about, that um, the problem is a systematic problem. It's not a problem of rogue landlords. It's a problem of how housing operates in Britain, how housing is commercialized, and also how our possibilities of living without being private renters are completely excluded from us. This is, this is part of missing, this is part of the sell-off of social housing, it's part of the criminalization of squatting. People have no opportunities to live without being forced into the private rented sector. My experiences of the private rented sector are quite bad, but circumstantially I'm probably in a better position than most. This is what I find truly depressing, is that most people in the private rent sector, most people forced into the private rent sector by a lack of supply of council housing are in a substantially worse position than I am. Thank you. Thanks very much, Tom. Um, next we've got Shima. Hello, everybody. Um, you know, I'm here to share Closer. my story with, uh, with you guys here. I live in Potter House, uh, and uh, um, there's a plan to knock down my building and other buildings in, in the area, like the whole square. Uh, this is also because of the, the location. Um, and the area where we live in is kind of like they're trying to, uh, in a state of increasing the social houses and affordable houses, and uh, you know, the, the, what's happening that we will end up having in, in, in this particular area no social houses anymore. They actually, all the social houses in the area, they are right now just planning to knock it down. So where are people going to go? And why we have to be pushed? Just because we feel too small uh, next to those two buildings for you that they are uh, trying to, to do here in London. Uh, and um, that we have uh, uh, old people, we have disabled people, and why our community has to be broken and why we have to be dispersed uh, outside of our area. Um, it's just, uh, I just want to add also, this is this area is in South Africa, South Africa also, in particular from this area where we are in uh, living, um, it's, it's, it's a small building, and even though the council has accepted um, the, the, the developer's plan, uh, even though it does contradict with, the, with their own policy. Uh, and another point that I want to add here is the lack of transparency, uh, that we have not been told anything at all. We only find out by the chance through one of the websites. And when we, are, when we approach the council, approach the landlord, approach the landowner, we will just uh, have to get um, all the lines and all the executors and uh, uh, and it's just, uh, it's just uh, maybe we were lucky to find out by the chance so we can maybe try to take some steps by, for example, coming here and try to deliver our voices and share our story with everyone else. Thank you. Yay. Um, Eva, would you like to say something? Hello, my name's Eva. I'm from Fuel Poverty Action, and just wanted to say a little bit about the impact of fuel poverty on housing and vice versa. So, you might have heard about the Green Deal, so the government scheme. Uh, very few people have taken it up because it basically isn't any kind of good deal at all, and it only really applies to you if you own a house. What it is is that you get to insulate your house and 
put in all sorts of energy saving measures, but you've got to pay all that money back. So if you're in the private rented sector, which a lot of poor people, precarious people are, you're not going to go for this deal. So it's been a big failure. The second um, thing that the government has cut recently is basically it was known as the um, ECO, Energy Company Obligation, and what that helped people with was that the poorest people actually got free insulation which the energy companies were supposed to provide. Now, you know, we all kind of paid for that and it would have saved people like well over £150 a year um, in energy, but because this has been scrapped under the guise of it being a, a sort of green tax and actually it was quite useful, people are going to be suffering even more, they're not going to get free insulation at all. And one thing that we found through our research and organisation is that there's, there's a lot of people who are living in very damp, uh, badly insulated housing, and this is exacerbated when, for instance, you're on a key meter, um, and about 8 million people are on prepayment meters. Is anyone here on a prepayment meter? Yeah, it's a nightmare. So we've come across people getting in touch with us who have been sitting in the cold and the dark, unable to turn anything on for five days, up to five days. And you end up getting down, you end up getting on the station, you end up getting uh, a very cold house, which you're not responsible for. And, you know, the government might tell us, just put on a jumper, um, but this doesn't help and it doesn't deal with, with cold, damp homes. And children growing up in cold, damp homes are five times more likely to have mental health problems, uh, likely also to do worse at school, have worse concentration, and also have a lot of shame and stigma around inviting people around and you know it's a common knowledge that mi you know many many people just leave their homes uh, to go to the shopping centre to keep warm or you know anywhere libraries or anywhere they can to actually avoid being in the freezing cold. Uh, we, we're building up for a campaign against tea meters um, about 90% of them are, uh, 80% are imposed on people with, without their permission, against their will. Energy companies have actually got the legal right to break into your home and install one uh, to reclaim debt. Anyway, it's, it's a nightmare. We want to get rid of it. And we hope that all of you will come and, and join us in a protest at the British Gas AGM on May the 12th. The call for energy to come under public control for there to be um, free insulation and energy saving possibilities for everybody. So, hope to see you there. Yeah. Um, thanks, everyone. I don't have a next person lined up. Would anybody like to drink, yeah? Sure. <laughs> it's uh, live streaming. There's only about 10 people watching. Okay. Uh, yeah, yes, I guess. <laughs> Careful. Hi, so, um, Ouch. That's loud. Okay, I'm Obi from uh, Occupy London. Uh, somebody pointed out this, uh, I don't know, some data to us. If you own a 30 million pound house in this country, that's actually, uh, you have to pay something like £2,000 uh, thousand tax. If you have £30 million pounds worth of gold bullion and you need to uh, store it, it's going to cost you £127,000. In New York, if you own a £30 million pound house in Manhattan, you have to pay 2% property tax. So that's what, £600,000 a year? Uh, <laughs> so actually, that's the reason why London is uh, the reserve currency of choice for the super rich. And yeah, and people like uh, Boris Johnson, uh, who actually thinks quarter of a million is um, uh, change, penny, actually is uh, are very happy of that because they're, uh, they're the ones who actually are speculating a lot on the property. And, uh, and a lot of the, I mean, a lot of the times when we actually take over a commercial site in central London, we find out that the, the business rates that um, I don't know, a five story building would pay would probably be about five pounds per year. And we actually contact the owners and say, okay, we'll pay the, we'll pay the business rate for you, five pounds. And they say no. And then we get evicted <laughs> very quickly when uh, they find out about us. And that's it, really. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, would anyone else like to come up and speak? I wonder if maybe somebody from Quadrant House would like to come and speak, seeing as you've got your lovely banners. Yeah, thanks. Okay, that was that was limp. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Jasmine, this is Jasmine. Hello, I live at Quadrant House, just down the road of Bank Mayor. 
public therefore a number of years. I recently noticed on something called the STD, which is a supplementary planning document, uh. that my home was shaded in in pink. Shaded in pink, and I thought, never know. <laughs> um, and I thought, you know, what, what could that possibly mean? Because alongside all the other areas shaded in pink was this word intensify. And intensify appears to mean knock down your home, build in its place lots of what are called affordable homes, but of course they're not affordable unless they have a very large salary. <coughs> and dispatch people like myself who've lived here for all of my adult life to a home in a different place. We have no firm information from our landlord, from our landowner, about what is going to happen and what that little pink coloration might mean. So, of course, we fear the worst. And so, of course, we're out here saying absolutely no way. Over our dead bodies, we need to demolish quadrant health and take our homes away from us because nobody wants to be homeless. We don't mean. Nobody wants to be without a bed to wake up in, a bathroom to go to wash in, a place to sit and feel at peace, which I've done for 37 years. I've had the pleasure of having a really good, warm home to be in, and I'm going to stay in it. I'm not going to see me on the tree, and just pulling it down on the side. <laughs> it's up, we're going to fight to keep it. So, really appreciate your support. Say bye. Oh, home is just up the road there. Do not mind saying hello if you're walking up. Thank you, Deborah. Um, all right, we got anybody else? Yes. Yeah. 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 This is Rob. Hello. Hi, I'm, I'm Rob from the Community Food Growers Network. And we're a group of groups that grow food plants, try and put land back into community use and support other people to grow food around London. Um, last year, one of our members at the Haygate Estate uh, disappeared off the face of London. They had a wonderful garden and many people in the local area ate that food. And that garden is no longer there. What's replaced is cranes and diggers destroying the Haygate Estate. And this tree is from, this is the, the last of the Haygate Garden. It's very sad. So, actually, you know, the process in which myth and tape where developers are making money out of council estates being knocked down, affects our work to take control of our food system. So when we talk about housing, water uh, and land, they're all, we're, they're all related and that's why we as the community food growers have, have come here today. Um, and also we, we always get asked to take part in these regeneration schemes. Can you have a little plot of food growing space in the corner of the new luxury apartment so that we can greenwash this regeneration and profit making. So we're here today to say uh, we want to stand with communities trying to fight for their land and, and for their homes and, and we'll stand with you. Thank you. Um, yes? This is John. I am John. Um, I'm a poet and I, uh, fight, I've been fighting for 15 years to save the Crossbones Graveyard in Went Cross Way, where we've made a shrine for outcasts and outsiders in this area where I've lived for 27 years. But I'm going to out myself here. I've been to Mippin. I went as a, as a Senate so Council took me to Mippin with their sort of clown fools. And I agreed to go as long as I could talk about Crossbones. And they gave me some money, which they did. I'm really glad I went because I saw what it really is. Uh, it's in Cannes. Uh, where they hold film festival, they also hold the porn festival. It's closer to the porn festival, in every sense. This is uh, property porn, on a massive scale. There were all the Russian cities there, Kiev and Sochi, and there was Southern Council there. And they were all joining in one thing, which was to sell their city to global capital, which was looking for a home to park itself. And that is what is happening. That's what's happening in Southwark. It's why they decanted the Haygate estate. It's why Boris is so happy to go with any really big, big plan that will just uh, sell the whole thing. Yeah, I work for your money. <laughs> so uh, if we want a community, we've got to, uh, we've got to fight for our city. Uh, we've got to come out and stand and challenge the whole concept of what a home is for. 
is a home and a place to live to build the community. And uh, if, if, we, if it's just sold to the highest bidder, then all the super rich are just going to live in gated communities in fear of their lives. So even their heaven will be a living hell for them. So let's save them and let's save ourselves. More power to us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, John. Um, would anyone else like to speak? Yes. Hey, my name's Jimmy. Um, several years ago, when I used to be at university, I ended up uh, homeless uh, because of a personal situation. And I was brought in to uh, a uh, squat by other people. Now, as you know, that squatting is uh, going to be made illegal eventually, even for commercial buildings, which is an uh, absolute crime because uh, the majority of people that are young in my age are unemployed. It's one of the highest uh, youth employments in, um, in this uh, continent and also in the UK as well. Um, one of the other things I'd like to say is that they continue to build massive buildings, they continue, continue to match build extremely expensive apartments, and this, this is overpricing and out for people, especially young people. And if you look around you right now, look at all the buildings that they're building, these buildings, these massive buildings and all this, you know, where is the money at the end of the day? They say there's a crisis at the end of the day. Whose crisis is it at the end of the day? <laughs> there. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Alright. So uh, we're gonna now have a little song um, to finish up our uh, to finish up our speak to. Um, thank you so much to everybody for sharing your story. Um, do you wanna come over here guys? <laughs> actually a uh, public property or something, yeah. Uh, okay. No, actually, uh, so, uh, so, so what, 77 acres of public land has been sold off. Center, actually. Are they council housing or social housing? Okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Yeah, same she, yeah, she same she managed to buy it. No, I had a, a new girl, she did the same thing, had a one bed flat in her court. But then it was council housing, she decided to give it to a friend of it. And he said nothing there, but then now that he knew, he would have actually kept it. Or it. But that's still like, I mean, for me, like, it is actually it's just crazy what they, what they do. All the advice that we've had in the last, what, 60 years, they just destroyed it. Uh, <laughs> Privatized everything. <laughs> Fuck the Bengalists, fuck the Polarations, fuck the fucking Ranglers. Um, Alright, thank you. <laughs> um, thanks for all of you for coming today. Um, I think, you know, this is, this is just the beginning. Um, we're, we're just starting to, to join the dots between all the different struggles that people are facing across London um, and across the UK and indeed across Europe. Today is in solidarity with um, housing movements in cities across Europe uh, because this isn't just a local problem, it's not just a national problem, it's a global pro problem of global capital and global inequality um, and that's why we need to come together to find the solution. Um, so yeah, today's the beginning and if you'd like to um, find out more about the Radical Housing Network as well, which put out the call for today. Um, you can find us on radicalhousingnetwork.org. Um, see you all again soon. Go ahead. Um, Just wanted to quickly add um, that people may have seen in the call out that actually this uh, action today is, like Theo said, in solidarity with a lot of other movements across Europe. And People are going to be taking action in 10 different cities across Europe on March the 12th. We decided to pit them to it and, and get in a little early, partially so we can get a little bit of energy around this uh, and get MIP in known. Uh, and we've got a whole week ahead of us and there's a big list of uh, corporations, of local councils, of construction firms, uh, that a lot of people uh, who, who are active around housing and other issues here may well have come into contact with before. That list is up on the website. And if anyone wants to have a look uh, and think about how they might be able to exert some pressure, um, really we do want to stop uh, these people going to MIPIM and at the end of the day we want to stop MIPIM itself. There's going to be an international uh, sort of mock tribunal uh, in Cannes uh, next week and we're presenting some of the case studies that you may have seen if you've got a flyer. Um, if you didn't get one, I think there's some over here um, where we're sort of showcasing a little bit of those case studies of three council estates um, in London that have been sold off and have almost no social rented uh, property available in them now. So um, yeah, keep tuned for what's going on in the rest of Europe really part of the reason it's so important for us to do this solidarity work is because in some places in southern Europe um, they don't actually have domestic control of their housing policy. It's totally controlled by the European Central Bank and the Troika and these guys as well. They've got something to do with it as well I believe. Um, so uh, the formation of this European coalition was in response to the call from Portugal, from Spain, from Italy, from Greece, from these countries that need our support uh, in international solidarity around housing because they can't do it alone with their national housing movement. And that's why it's really important, I think, for us to support them and that's part of why uh, we're um, getting involved in the anti mipim protest. The first MIPIM ever to come to the UK is happening this October in Manchester. Um, unfortunately, Manchester activists weren't able to make it down to today, but we're going to be opening a conversation with them uh, about how we want to respond to that uh, as a community of people um, linked by uh, our desire to change what's happening in, in, in our housing. Um, and we're going to be opening that conversation soon, and if anyone wants to get involved in it, come and talk to the Radical Housing Network. It's quite difficult for us to directly do much about MIPIM when it's in the south of France. However, Manchester is not so far away. Um, 
so yeah, uh, keep keep in touch. Hope everyone had a really nice day. If you if you want a, a for sale sign, <laughs> don't quite know what you do with it, but um, they look all right on on posts. On yeah, stick, stick it to uh, stick it over there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we can do a bit of fly posting. Uh, there's probably a staple gun somewhere. Um, <laughs> cool. Um, bust the tune. <laughs> Okay, guys, thank you so much for joining us. And uh, yeah, if you could keep tweeting this out. And I think you know about the details about what happened to uh, Chris's phone. And uh, well, the. Uh, <laughs> oh boy. And yeah, what's actually happening now, actually, that uh, we need to raise money for that and for the. the and for the uh, the use of the phones as well, uh, they're about uh, 40 pounds each, which is damn, damn annoying. Anyway, yeah, if you could actually, yeah, uh, yeah, send us uh, PayPal accounts actually on that one. Yeah, Nemo GVR at Yahoo.co.uk. <laughs> and yeah, see if I can actually last you some more tonight. But uh, yeah, watch out. I think there's something happening this weekend. Okay, guys, thank you so much and uh, peace out. And thank you, UK watching and uh, everybody else, Carl, for tweeting these things. Great. Bye.